Hello and welcome everyone. Today is Thursday, October 13th, uh, and it's our community call. Uh, and today we were planning on talking about uh, kind of um, general funding of public goods, especially for the kind of organizations that uh, that SCRF is trying to itself be in terms of supporting research and infrastructure, just uh, generally chatting about funding. I see that we have a smaller overall audience than usual so i'm also happy to just see uh if there's anything particularly on anyone's mind or if anyone has a, a topic or thing they'd like to explore beyond the the conversation i just mentioned um but yeah otherwise we will jump into fundraising so i'll just uh give a moment uh to see if anyone has anything else on their mind today uh, which uh, if anyone has any housekeeping notes or other meetings or anything like that that you want to plug uh, please feel free to mention those here as well Really quick, we're going to be doing the um, coffee house after this. We're not doing a piece of research, but we're going to be talking about sort of what to do with the coffee house moving forward. Uh, and now that we've finished a couple episodes of the beta, and then uh, yeah, so if you want to participate in that to sort of talk about uh, f the future of it, feel free to jump on Discord right after this call. Perfect. Thank you, Jonathan. Anyone have any other kind of plugs or anything? Hello, Nick. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and plug a couple of things. So first thing to plug is tomorrow uh, is the SourceCred Guild meeting uh, we'll, where we will be talking about what kind of the current configuration is, uh, as well as maybe using some hybrid models for how funds are distributed uh, as a result of source cred. And I'm happy to answer questions about source cred and all that type of stuff in, in that meeting as well, or here or in Discord, uh, wherever people would like to ask source cred questions. Uh, but yeah, so that guild is meeting tomorrow. Uh, it should be on the events page of Discord, um, but that is at 4 p.m. Eastern time on Friday. Um, in addition to that, uh, I also just kind of want to plug the um, continuing good work of the cohort. If you have not had an opportunity to interact with people on the forum who have been producing cohort work uh, or comments as a result of their work in the synthesis writing cohort, um, I strongly encourage people to at least kind of give them a read, uh, maybe like some of the work. I know that people are putting some good time and energy into doing some research and some thinking and some multiple drafting of some of those comments. And it's really, I think, made a positive impact on some of the threads on the forum. Uh, and then also, is this a reminder that you can, of course, nominate some of those for comment of the month? Uh, so we just had our recent poll for the last comment of the month, and you should see the socials uh, announcing some of the winners and congratulating them. Uh, the newest nomination thread is now open, and so feel free to nominate people there if you think that they've done some really good work. Uh, you should be able to notice on the forum that there is a more persistent banner um, at the top of every thread. It's not quite uh, where I think that we could potentially eventually get it, where we can have an easier solution to just kind of be able to nominate some stuff, but you can always find the comment of the month along the banner on any part of the forum. It is in yellow. Um, you can also get to the Research Pulse newsletter, which um, we can I can let uh, Michael talk about if you would like to talk about that. Um, but there's those small baby user improvements uh, for people to be aware of as well. Great, thank you, Paul. Yeah, Michael, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so um, thank you, Paul and Eugene. Yeah, the Research Pulse newsletter um, is going strong. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already. There are links. Um, on the forum, as Paul mentioned. Um, I can also drop the links in the chat if anybody would like those directly, either for Substack or Mirror. Um, the Substack version is going out every Wednesday via email, and you can access either of those on the web throughout the week. So um, sign up, tell your friends if you haven't already. If you need a link, um, send me a message or ping me on Discord, and I'm, I'm happy to help you with that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, exciting to see. Uh, both uh, the subscriptions keep rolling on in for the newsletter uh, and to see all the interaction from the Taptive Writing Cohort. Uh, and in case anyone's new to the community and hadn't heard of the cohort before, uh, it's kind of our first joint program with Taptive. And uh, we will most likely be uh, 
be doing some again in the future. So if you are interested uh, in any particular topics or anything like that, uh, please do not be shy in letting us know. And so I'll just give another moment in case anyone has uh, any other kind of events or anything else going on they want to mention. Cool. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, unless someone does have, and please do feel free to, to kind of interrupt and jump in with either the virtual hand or just hop off mute uh, and hop in. Uh, but I, I wanted to just kind of have another discussion uh, with our community and kind of building on some previous discussions that we've had in the past around the question, um, specifically today, to delve into what are we seeing as kind of different models of funding public goods, funding research in the Web3 space, uh, and yeah, just what, what are some things that we could and should be thinking about potentially in that regard? Um, and yeah, just uh, obviously this is triggered by the fact that uh, you know, SCURF is transitioning to this multi-funder environment. Uh, and so uh, a point of good news is that it looks as though uh, Protocol Labs will be the first uh, external organization beyond uh, Chainlink coming in to support uh, to support SCURF, uh, which is obviously very exciting. And then we're currently working on uh, grant submissions to a couple of other organizations, and we obviously are going to pursue uh, you know, Web3 grants throughout the remainder of this year, uh, you know, as we start pursuing uh, becoming a, a, an official 501c3, uh, you know, that will open the door for some traditional corporates and foundations, excuse me, um, and potentially even government. Um, and then, right, if we look at the Web3 space with groups like Optimism that are very much on like impact equals profit and uh, still this idea uh, that uh, public goods should still be revenue generating, uh, you know, the question of how much, uh, yeah, just any anyone who has a, an opinion of the intersection of our activities and that kind of view. Um, yeah, and just kind of broadly exploring this wide topic of uh, Web3 funding and public goods, or I guess the intersection of those topics specifically. So I will... Um, pause there for a moment in case anyone does have uh, any kind of uh, immediate uh, reactions or thoughts uh, when it comes to places that you think have been doing an interesting job uh, in fundraising around public goods and making any kind of public goods sustainable, uh, or if we still see a lot of, uh, yeah, let me know if you have any models or you still feel as though uh, most folks are uh, exploring and there, there, there aren't that many great models of sustainable uh, public goods yet in the space. So yeah, we'd love to hear what folks think on that. Go for it, Chris. Yeah, sorry, I just didn't want to jump in. Um, I think actually looking at the Ethereum Foundation and the positive things that they have done in the context of establishing legal protections around ethereum while also going out of their way to ensure that the foundation itself uh stays in the realm of building the framework out into the public good has actually been one of the i guess more sustainable examples that i've seen in the last decade or so um and not to say that there aren't others but i think it's probably the most obvious uh but in a way there are things that there are mistakes that they made early on that they rectified later um in various aspects of the organization so i think in understanding that the reason that ethereum foundation has been able to persist is that it's not because they didn't make any mistakes. It's that whenever they made mistakes, they rectified them instead of doubling down. I think that's uh, not to say that we need, again, not to say we need to follow their model every step more. So I think it's great that um, the infinite machine has been looked at in the reading groups, but also uh, I do think that 
they are, like I said, one of the more sustainable examples. So it's like the things that have emerged in the last two or three years might have some good concepts within them. But I think something that has about, it, you know, roughly a decade's worth of existence underneath its belt while also being fairly still nascent in its structure is a great example um, that we could look to for uh, informing our evolution. Yeah, absolutely. And I know in the, in the infinite machine, uh, one thing that I definitely didn't realize um, was some of the, I, I had heard some general kind of ideas that, you know, early in, uh, in the development of ETH, there were different opinions of for-profit, non-profit and the structures. I didn't realize exactly who was in which of the different camps uh, as was kind of outlined in the book. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting to, to think of how important uh, kind of the governance, and I guess this could be its own deeper discussion overall of uh, kind of what is the role of uh, Vitalik and other specific individuals within the EF uh, to kind of keep it within that realm uh, and not letting it uh, fully become overly financialized and uh, and built kind of as a uh, thinking about that protocol as a public good in some kind of way, even if the currency had to exist around it. Um, and yeah, it's also interesting to think when it's such a fundamental, I don't know if anyone listens to the Ezra Klein podcast, uh, but he just had Vitalik on. Uh, so it's interesting to hear kind of Vitalik speaking in that more general uh, kind of audience. And I don't know if anyone has started reading or has looked at uh, Proof of Stake, which is Vitalik's book uh, that came out that was edited by Nathan Schneider recently. Um, but yeah, it's just really interesting to think also how much of that public good uh, is it easier to build or quote unquote easier? That was not an easy thing to do. Uh, but is, is there more room for them and kind of the for the things that are appropriate for global protocols that you know you can use technology uh, to try to to uh, create a system that. Uh, does not need the social level of trust just for a single more narrow, you know, a protocol level of money or computation or something like that um, versus actually trying to build more narrow uh, public goods that are much smaller scale. And then how do you uh, make those sustainable, I think, is a really interesting point of comparison as well. Uh, but yeah, thank you for sharing there, Chris. And does anyone? Oh, please, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, sorry not to belabor that, but you reminded me that I, you know, having been there early on, one of the things that was asserted is that it has to be sustainable. So, like, one of the cultures that emerged in the blockchain space was, like, the expectation that developers would work for free or would work for the sake of the public good. Um, and that's not sustainable in that a developer may want to work for a public good but they need to have a residence in which to work which necessitates money uh, they need to have electricity and internet access which necessitates money so it's not actually sustainable to expect developers to work for free which is where originally the ethereum concept where you know the whole reason they well not the whole one of the main reasons they added gas um and uh monetization of the protocol was to address the mathematic inconsistency of nothing can be sustainable with the expectation that people are going to be doing it for free uh, perpetually. So this is where the notion that people deserve to be compensated for their time and efforts were at the root of the DAO concept and sense of people adding their times and efforts to the public good of this platform deserve some sort of compensation so there is it's like not to say that a public good should be done by people who believe in it for the sake of the the project only and they should do it for free but rather the project and the public good itself should work to ensure that people working f for the the goal are protected in enough of a way that it allows them to keep working towards that goal and this is where there is a gap between uh working for something with the pure intention of altruistic outcome whereas there needs to be a mathematically sustainable trajectory in which that can take place and that involves ensuring that the capital flow is not depleted so that 
the project or the organization stays at least liquid enough to protect the most important players. Yeah, for sure. Does anyone else have any other kind of thoughts um, either responding, you know, and thinking of something like Ethereum specifically uh, or more broadly at the high level um, around public goods funding? What's the, the root question here as it relates to SCURF? So initially it's just exploring some general, you know, uh, just wanted to chat about some general examples. Uh, once it's coming back to SCURF, it's starting to think about uh, what models can we draw inspiration from in the long term for the various opportunities uh, ahead of SCURF, right? Because I, I think that uh, as of right now, we are very much pursuing more of the philanthropic funding model going after grants, as mentioned, you know, once we become 501c3, focus even more on grants. Um, but nonetheless, I think uh, in the long run, right, even with something like granting, uh, it's, you know, do we th think about building a consistent fundraising team that just always goes, you know, goes out and does grants all the time uh, versus do we think that a, a potential future model is going to be more dedicated drip funding? Uh, where it's kind of much longer term commitments the way in academic circles, there's like the, the endowed chair or something like that that's meant to be like a 10 or 20 year investment uh, support in a single direction. Uh, you know, will there be more uh, kind of drip funds created uh, to support direct organizations or initiatives? Uh, and we recently heard from the proposal inverter crew and thinking about how those kind of tools might create um, different kind of opportunities to support research infrastructure in the first place. So that's where I'm trying to lead it towards. Gotcha. So, so if you want to just jump right there, feel free to. Yeah. So there's a different way to look at Ethereum and blockchains rather than public goods. Like a, a ledger is a public good. Sure, it's used by the public, et cetera. But it, it's their, their network goods. Uh, the developers of these blockchains never worked for free. Uh, you position yourself with a stake in a network and then you contribute to the development of that software with the expectation that by developing the software it will be adopted by more people and produce more product. So the GDP of that network will increase. It's similar to how we work for governments, even though we work for like corporations, et cetera. We're just increasing the GDP of our nation. Uh, so we can use that perspective from SCURF uh, to uh, think about the networks we partner with and support. Uh, and this gets into tokenization, et cetera, and I don't really necessarily agree with it, but it is a perspective we might want to consider. But uh, if we take stake in the networks we support with the expect that we're now participants in that network. So as that network continues to develop, uh, we reap the benefits. Um, so you, you can become essentially stakers or miners in these networks, or you can position yourself to, to develop grant programs for these uh, various blockchain networks that seem to have uh, value sets that align with SCURFs. Uh, and, and so you can, by helping develop these mission aligned, these value aligned networks, you are also helping increase the uh, liquidity of SCURFs uh, position. So the, that, that's basically it. So you, you can look at these as network uh, network goods where help by helping the network, you're actually helping yourself. And just to clarify there, do you see um, in that kind of example, if we, uh, you know, either SCURF or an organization like SCURF, but if any public goods org uh, is trying to take that model of more, you know, in the, in the direction of staking, um, I mean, there's an interesting question of how much of that is literally just coming in and playing the role of, you know, minor in the ecosystem or trying to come up with different type of structures. And, uh, you know, theoretically, let's just say that, you know, we uh, we have a discussion with, you know, Optimism or Talent DAO or whatever community and to potentially incentivize using other groups tokens on our forum. Um, so, yeah, I was just wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little more on, on what you were thinking when you mentioned that. Sure. So there's a difference between the token and the currency, right? So we, the incentivization of using another community's token is interesting uh, and I think comes with benefit, like allowing people to tip with BAT 
uh, is an example that, that they use with Reddit. They, they integrated with Reddit and I think GitHub and, and whatever. Uh, so you could tip with exactly we already use die and source grid but you could tip with it, talent DAO's governance token stuff like that but that's completely different from a public good or a network good which is a blockchain which is securing a public ledger an immutable ledger that, that is used to record um, data uh, whether it's monetary transactions or the scientific record etc so if you take a stake in that good the blockchain network that is minting a currency perpetually based on open source code you can contribute to the adoption of that network uh, which is different than contributing to the growth of a sub network which is talent DAO, which is a token built on ethereum uh, so you can the the position i would advocate for if at all because <laughs> i'm still not sure if i i think this is something that fits scripts mission but it is essentially purchasing tokens or becoming a miner, being a contributor in that network, and then facilitating and then getting money in through donations or some other means, selling swag, why not? And then uh, using that income to help development of that network. Uh, so the root network that then supports maybe this community that is also mission aligned with SCURF and in a partnership like Talent DAO, uh, Supporting that root network benefits talent DAO, also benefits the direct holding and participations of SCURF, um, and also develops a public good, which is that public ledger, uh, which is used to run a whole bunch of uh, virtual machine software, which is really cool. So there, I, I, it's a complex uh, outcome. It's a complex way to, way to do it. I'm not entirely sure exactly what it would look like, but... Um, yeah, it would. It might be interesting. It might be worth exploring. Yeah, yeah. That's and Chris, I see you have your hand raised. Before yeah, you jump in. So there, those, all of those things that were posed have very uh, high potential in the best outcomes. Um, the issue becomes: Does having those tokens create a conflict of interest? especially in the context of a research organization that is hopefully trying to create some semblance of objectivity. Um, and one of the things, like having cr created multiple tokens myself, in the context of a research organization, um, getting, rid, uh, getting rid of vested interests and ensuring that the research environment is free from the influence of capital directing the outcome of that research is one of the uh, more uh, objective facilitating uh, goals concerning aligning the capital with objectivity in that, for, as an example, it's really difficult for SCURF to put any research on the forum that says anything critical of Chainlink if Chainlink is our only uh, funding source or anything negative at all. Not to say that we should, but if there's research out there or things that need to be addressed, if we are funded by Chainlink or holding Chainlink tokens, it's going to make it a lot more difficult to be open or objective about those things. So that's where um, right. it, it becomes potentially overly complex to start trying to take on token holdings as a means of building the ecosystem when those organizations could just invest regular currency. What well, it doesn't have to be dollars. It could be euros. It could be uh, yen. It, it doesn't have to be dollars. The issue is, uh, does, or it could be die. Do, does SCURF create a conflict of interest by starting to take on tokens of organizations that could potentially be subject to research. I think the risk is potentially high, but then it's like maybe if we uh, create boundaries, if we take money from organizations, then we just uh, start to either say, oh, on, on research summaries where it discusses these organizations, put notices that SCURF is funded by these in the same way that YouTube puts paid uh, advertisement notices 
um, just to be transparent or have arbitrary, not arbitrary, but uh, ethical lines of ensuring that if someone's giving money to scurf, then we're not uh, putting out literature that is misrepresentative of them to make it, them look more positive as if they're buying reputational benefits through scurf funding um so that's where again it's like those things definitely could be possible but it's almost over complex for them to give us tokens when they could just give us currency yeah, and I guess even before getting into the uh, the more complicated, because I do agree that there's, um, yeah, a lot of interesting questions to unpack in that kind of scenario that, that John was outlining before. But I think an even more basic question that we absolutely will be facing soon is, right, what happens when we get a grant issued in non-stable? Um, as a neutral third party, do we... Right, because part of my gut reaction is like, oh, auto convert to stables, uh, and especially given in the short term when it's like, oh, we're, we're fundraising realistically are uh, very close to what we're spending um, as we're transitioning away from this kind of uh, from the model we were in to more having a longer term treasury, right? So in the short term, uh, it seems logical to mitigate, you know, minimize any any kind of market fluctuations uh, as we're getting roughly how much we're spending. But as we go to like build a treasury. Right? Do we, from a financial prudence perspective, it's not a good idea to hold in a single currency. But then, is it purely based on financial logic, or right? And is there the concern that departing from quote unquote uh, just financial norms to like, oh well, if we hold a little more ETH and is considered normal, then is that like signaling that we are uh, ETH bulls or something like that? And how conscious do we need to be? of the role that we are playing in the ecosystem as a neutral third party and the signals we're sending as our treasury develops from just being in DAI to, uh, I'm assuming the grants that we get from most ecosystems are gonna be in their ecosystem native currency. So uh, I would separate, so th there's very good points to both of this, the conflict of interest and what to do, like the financial um, responsibility for for what to do with currencies that come in in various different forms. And like people get paid millions of dollars a year to do this for large organizations, right? How, financial management. Uh, so I would separate with cryptocurrencies, I would specifically separate financial incentive from what the network does, the, the network's value set. So if a network values the same thing scurf values hold that currency and it doesn't matter if it, it's, it's a signal of support for that value set if that value set changes get out of that network because by holding a currency depending on the security um the consensus algorithm you are signaling support for um whatever they're doing so you can hold ethereum uh to whatever level you value that uh that network's values has as forever whatever level your values align with ethereum uh and from a to, to bring back the finances of it like just hold the currency to give it to uh, give to you um because it's cryptocurrency and either it goes up a lot or it goes to zero and if it goes to zero script doesn't exist anyway so <laughs> and it there's a lot more to that but that's the basic premise uh yeah, so I, I would look at it from a look for the values behind the network, not what the, the the translation of the currency is from that currency to a U.S. dollar. Yeah, I wanted to, like, I think that there is some points that Chris is raising in the comments as well about kind of financial advice and, and that particular issue. Um, but I'm also kind of interested in this idea of making these selections based on values and values alignment and then where um, or how do we make that type of assessment, right? So is that assessment made by um, white papers and PR looks correct uh, or uh, behavior and use is correct? And some of that behavior and use um, is to some extent not um, not up to the projects, not up to the the distributed ledger, um, but would we still want to be heavily, or would we want to hold tokens to um, a network that 
in actuality is not doing the type of things that we espouse. Like I'm kind of interested in like how do we determine or evaluate values um, and what you were just kind of talking about there, John? Yeah, so I think Doge is a great example. Uh, when Doge was started, its value set was humor, like bring some sobriety into the space. We're going to sponsor NASCARs. We're going to uh, do absolutely ridiculous stuff and, and have fun with this ability to create our own economic network with its own currency. Uh, and a lot of people appreciate uh, appreciated that. And Doge's values, despite continuing development, have kind of shifted to more uh, financial gaming. Uh, like, uh, I'll just leave it at that. So I would, if I was holding Doge in the beginning and I aligned with that value of just like lighthearted joy, uh, and then I noticed that the actual outcome of that network has changed, I would, it no longer aligns with my values. I would readjust my holdings based on, rather my stake in that network based on what the network's actually doing. So it's not so much about the PR and marketing. From my perspective, it would be looking at what that network actually does. You know, Bitcoin was marketed as digital cash. It has never been digital cash. So it, it might get there one day, but uh, it can say one thing, but whether or not it actually is that thing uh, is, is up to how it's used. And I even wonder in terms of operationalizing something like that values alignment, does that then mean you have to have like a pretty consistent value alignment check with your community uh, and how they feel with the values? Or is it just like triggered at certain points when something happened with the values of a different ecosystem or something like that? Yeah, the implementation would be really interesting of how to actually rebalance. Because you're basically rebalancing portfolio, but you're not basing it on financial uh, desires. You're basing it on what, like value alignment. So like, does is it a continuous poll? And then community members like bring it up, like, hey, this network isn't really doing what we, we uh, why we, what they said they were, or what we thought they were doing when we took a stake in that network to support them. Uh, so I'm going to change my vote off of that and, and reposition that stake somewhere else in a different network or like, I, I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. So For sure, yeah. and I just want to quickly check just Mary Jane, I see you're off mute. Did you want to hop in with something? Uh, and if not, do you mind just please muting to avoid background noise and then Chris can go. But if you did want to jump in, please jump in Mary Jane. Seems like it's all yours, Chris. Yeah, um, so there is, there's the Nash equilibrium, but then there's uh, the Brace paradox where things are too complex and it starts to slow down the progress. It's like, if we have not gotten to a point where we have a single uh, clear monetary um, source of income and like structure to clear that income getting into treasuries and token holdings starts to get like cart way cart before horse uh but even discussing the notion of aligning community values like that as as eugene's pointing out that's constantly going to change so i do think there especially in the context of if we have uh if we started with a research focus, creating a financial treasury that assesses uh, potential good holdings and then uses those things as a way to build uh, connections to those communities has potential, but it also starts to get too close to ruining the objectivity of the actual research that was the initial foundation so that's where i'm like as a researcher i know the things that got me uh comfortable in the in the scurf community based on the the things that were decided early on moving towards um like a, a community voting on a token holding model would make me not want to actually do my person like as a researcher, I wouldn't want to post my research on that type of forum, but in building a 
neutral ground in which different protocols can be discussed, starting to move towards holding specific tokens starts to ruin that neutrality in a way. So I do think in building one of the most neutral forums for discussion in the Web3 space, starting to show preference for Web3 companies by holding their tokens is, I think, a move in, in a backwards and potentially wrong direction for a research-based organization, if we are continuing to be research-based. Yeah, and I'd be interested if anyone does have any kind of, um, yeah, because I, I personally tend to very much agree with that, and I struggle to kind of find a good reason to, like, why would we want to, you know, hold ETH or OPT or whatever, unless we agree with one of them specifically of like oh let's say optimism gave us a grant so that we issue research summary grants in opt if we decided to be okay with that that that's one reason to hold their currency but aside from that are there any reasons that people can come up with where it does make sense for us to kind of open-endedly from an investment perspective hold on to the currencies of other groups or does it just come back to that financial question and then it's not a uh, you know, we're not making judgment calls. It's we're doing what's financially prudent or something to that effect. I largely agree with uh, you guys, with Chris and, and you, Eugene. It is, it, but there's another side to it, right? Like it, if you want to be absolutely completely neutral, you any donation or grant that comes to you that requests you use their currency, you say, no, we're converting it to DAI and we'll always use a DAI or some sort of stable coin. But that might turn people off. So if you are going to accept those sort of uh, quid pro quos in a sense, like we'll give you a currency, but you have to use that currency for X, Y, and Z, uh, you're, there's, there's going to need to be reasons that uh, we accept that from one organization and maybe not from another you know if we maybe we accept that from a mission aligned a value aligned network but not from another uh the only other reason to hold a currency is again to signal support for the network or to literally support the network if it's a proof of stake coin if it's a proof of stake network but that does tarnish uh neutrality but at the same time you know we're working with uh transparent ledgers so you just post the address of the organization and everyone everyone can make up their own minds about how much that is influencing posts on the forum because they can see how much holdings in, in whatever currency um, exists so i i do like absolute neutrality means working only in stable coins until you know there's a new basket currency or there's a bitcoin standard but it is yeah then if that's the case if that's the desire then there, there's no holding any other currency but i do think there are benefits to it yeah and i guess uh in that regard a specific question that i, I again would love to just hear people's opinions on and and you know just candid thoughts on um i just keep mentioning optimism for no particular reason other than like they're pretty public about caring about public goods they gave you tokens uh, and, damn it no, they didn't give us tokens yet. So uh, we haven't applied to them yet, but they do have a large grants program. And we are probably going to apply. And I know like Carl and some other folks who are, you know, have been there from the beginning are all super into, into research in general. Um, but someone uh, specifically mentioned that like, hey, if you pitch them this idea of give a grant, because they're also what, what's a problem that's top of mind for them is general OPT adoption. So if we were to, right, let's even say that for the treasury purposes, we, we do want to uh, stick to full neutrality. So nothing but stables on the, uh, on the level of our treasury. Uh, but then if we do get small grants, you know, like would we, how would people feel if we did something like an ecosystem gives us a grant to then grant in their currency, recognizing that, well, why can't we just auto convert that to a stable? Well, they want it for the benefit of the growth and, ap and adoption of their currency. Um, so I, I have mixed opinions on this and I don't know where I fully land on this yet. So I would uh, love to hear what people think. And I will also, I know Renee also has a lot of thoughts on this and she was not able to join today. So I will uh, definitely be chatting with her about it as well. But yeah, Chris, I see your virtual hand up, so please. So I think that's a beautiful solution and we can actually do both in that on one hand, if we have a treasury that only holds stable coins, so the organization itself 
signals the intent for neutrality, but on the other hand, we open up an avenue in which organizations can come in and provide grants to our community directly to guide research and specifically push research in the direction of their protocol with the understanding that they are trying to push adoption for their specific protocol, then that's transparent and that's not actually uh, attempting to feign objectivity. So those are two completely different approaches that can coexist with the understanding that if a grant is uh, offered explicitly by an organization like Optimism in their token, it's meant to push the community towards that goal with the understanding that it's a partnership towards uh, researching for that organization with the hope that the research benefits the larger scurf community but this again i do believe there is a research as a as a service model where we have the transparent platform that we have worked on to ensure that the research itself is transparent but if someone came in and gave a grant then we already have the process by which we can ensure both sides get their mutual benefit and keep the process transparent but keep that separate from the main scurf body while also ensuring that the main scurf body stays uh objective and attempts neutrality by only holding stable coins so i, I wonder if uh there could be a clause that's basically like yes we'll we'll hold your token to and and use it to fund uh research grants uh or, or research summaries whatever we use it for but we're not going to just use it for research on your project we're going to use it for the larger crypto ecosystem uh and for every project every research or every post that's funded by it it will be a big banner at the top or, or small banner whatever a notification that says uh this research was funded by a grant from optimism using obt whatever uh whatever information we want to put there but it makes sure that a large and, and wealthy well-funded entity can't come in and basically buy posts on the forum by saying we're going to give you a bunch of our currency but we only want it for research on our project uh, so that uh, thought here is to try and yeah. maintain that neutrality so that makes sense the version of it that i get scared of right and let's just take uh whether it's you know we're a pass through for research grants or you know we let uh, let's say we let people sponsor a coordinate circle or sponsor this month's source cred or whatever. Um, and it, let's say it's the source cred example, or even if it is, right, the primary research example. Um, if we're talking to actual like proper academic researchers, they are probably just going to want good old fashioned USD. I know <laughs> in, a, in a number of conversations, even getting the stable coins has been an interesting one. Um, but then I think it's especially right. It's one thing if it's like, oh, come in and, you know, you can end up earning source credit or you could get this, you know, uh, this grant that's denominated and die um, and that is easily uh, convertible. But then, right, if it's, you know, a new company launches and, you know, they're like moon token, whatever, and it's purely garbage. But for marketing purposes, they have allocated enough of a budget that they would love to put in, you know, 5k a month towards source cred, uh, issuing uh, ApeCoin or whatever, uh, it, which is a good bad example, because that actually exists. But right, like some coin uh, just like drops it in to be like, hey, we want source cred or whatever denominated in our currency. And even if it's an automatic sell on whoever gets it, do then right does the fact that like we've enabled someone to do that who might have questionable motives from the logic of oh well if we do it for one party then we have to do it for everyone um is that a potential danger or are there any other potential concern situations that that come to mind around this kind of stuff yeah it's the same thing as culture building like you, you don't need to do it for everyone you do it for whoever the hell you think aligns with your values like if, if shitcoin abc comes in uh just say no right and, and then if a uh, high risk project with a good alignment and good development and they're really trying but it's it's they're trying something novel and it's high risk say okay cool let's do it or if there's a really stable project that really aligns with the mission of scurf yeah great let's do it but it it comes down to scurf would have to decide each time um I, I my vision of it would not be completely open it would be gated 
moderated and there would be more no's than yeses when it comes to who who gets to do this yeah i i just completely agree with that notion in that um especially if it's not completely open it's actually more prestigious um so even though people would be paying like every the fact that we would turn people away potentially makes that uh partnership more valuable and more reputation building with the understanding that it's not purely about money and the values must be present in order to uh get scurf to take that type that type of risk with scurf's reputation um so i all the things that have been said um it does not need to be like for example like terra luna should not be able to just come in and buy research now while they're under investigation if their name is cleared that's one thing but scurf wouldn't be inclined i would think to take money from an organization that is under international investigation in the middle of the investigation and that would be like if they could offer a billion dollars and it would be like yeah no i i don't think so it's not just because it's a billion dollars it's not something we want to take at this point and put our our organization at risk of association with this type of activity or potential activity so in that right of refusal that is plenty to give scurf the capacity to have these options in place while also ensuring that yeah some sh uh unheard of coin that has never uh been anywhere but uniswap can't just come in and feign research to boost their token and then do a rug pull and then have scurf's reputation take the hit because we're the place that made everyone aware of that uh token right and to to add to the sort of benefit of being able to say no uh it, it if scurf only accepts this sort of uh token model for or token donation model for projects that support public goods or support larger ecosystems other than just their own project uh and at the same time, SCURF succeeds in becoming the place that people want to go and share research, and, and it SCURF brings a lot of eyeballs to any partnered project. Uh, then SCURF uh, indirectly is incentivizing projects to support public goods because the project wants to get on SCURF. SCURF only accepts this type of donation from projects supporting public goods. That project that wants to get on SCURF will find a way to support public goods. I do like this vision of uh, projects coming to us, like um, like truly a proposal of Verder. Projects come to us desperate to give us money, and uh, we get to say no. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of interested also as we kind of think about this, because um, I'm also in kind of agreement here with what is being said. And, um, I do hope that we become so desirable that everyone becomes fry and just is waving their tokens in our face, asking them to take it. Uh, but I'm I'm really interested in this idea of like how do you get the um, I mean, the mechanism of the community involved on, on these kind of yes, no's and um, is that changeable, right? So can, like as you used before the Dogecoin example, um, something starts off uh, terrible. Uh, it's, it's like some project starts off as terrible, but ultimately it becomes like an incredibly good project and it's changed uh, to a very public goods oriented project. Um, Scurf at one point said no, um, how do we, potentially give uh projects a second chance what's a mechanism like that's a that's kind of where my brain's at at the moment which is probably not what um we have time to fully get through but that's kind of where i'm at because yeah I, i'm liking this discussion yeah and i also just want to make sure to give a moment in case anyone else wanted to jump in uh and just provide any uh, either additional uh, support or dissenting views in, in kind of any direction just want to make sure to uh, encourage others to jump in um who haven't had a chance to yet yeah chris please feel free and yeah if anyone else does want to please feel free to jump in right after chris yeah i'll um speaking from personal experience i was not out early on i was monitoring the bitcoin community and was turned off by the general culture. I was actually attracted by Dogecoin's community and the uh, 
incent they incentivized public goods and participating in public goods pretty much from day one in that obviously it was a joke cryptocurrency but the actual community was uh public goods from day one so when you have a community where you can audit and see the history of the uh push towards incentivization of public goods that is easily track traceable within something like the dogecoin community whereas like other you know it's not really clear within the bitcoin so i do based on my personal experience i do think that there is the capacity for us to audit whether an organ or um, a community is focused on public goods as to uh ensure that we are aligned I, I like that there's also so we do this at gridcoin too it's just uh deciding where your resources go uh we have a lot of computational resources there are a lot of projects that we could incentivize with the protocol but we don't because they don't align with our, our either technical specs or our values and the way we determine which uh essentially projects to partner with even though it's not really a partnership uh is just someone in the community notices something's changed or or whatever and they put it up for a vote and the community votes on it and then either we add them to the incentivization mechanism or remove them from the incentivization mechanism or whatever the vote was asking for so you, there's a couple different ways to organize that type of vote it could be a running poll it can be a once a year thing it could be a every time this happens you have a vote or whenever a community member reaches a certain threshold in terms of like source cred or, or reputation within the community, depending on that reputation, depending on the scurf, depending on the scurf reputation model, uh, then they can put up a vote. But it, it, I I like voting. I also like spies. <laughs> yeah, scurf culture spies sounds very fun. Um... But yeah, I mean, I think the actual mechanism, uh, yeah, that I, I, that that part feels like something we will be able to kind of iterate and work out. Um, and so then I wonder, and recognizing that we only have just over two minutes left in this call, uh, and maybe this is more of a call to action to think for uh, for future conversation. But right as we shift from this model where we only had one stakeholder um and now we have a list of i think there's the list is now roughly of 18 or 20 potential organizations that we might go pursue funding from um what is kind of the nature of that transparency going to look like for now especially as we're exploring and what are the ways in recognizing we're not a DAO, we're not pretending to be a DAO, uh but nonetheless we at least want to hear from the community uh if there is a like hey that one group we would feel much better if you didn't take money from them um so i i you know i think we we will have to iterate on this process i'm happy to just quickly rattle off some of the names in case anyone wants to follow up uh after this um but yeah nonetheless for for helping to think through what does this process of accountability uh look like to the community as we explore other funders uh would definitely be helpful to think of uh but yeah the, the organizations we're generally exploring this is not prioritized in any way shape or form uh but uh, uh ave algorand aragon bitdao cardano uh cello compound consensus Ethereum, Near, Ocean, Optimism, Polygon. I mentioned Protocol already, though they're already starting to support us. Uh, SafeDAO slash Gnosis, uh, Solana, question mark, just because I don't actually know the state of grants there. Uh, Steel Perlot, Uniswap, and Web3 Foundation. Um, so, yeah, in an attempt to just start uh, from a note of a, some transparency, at least, you know, those are the groups we're going to be reaching out to. Uh, if anyone does have any concrete feedback, you have other ideas of groups to add to the list. If anyone has very strong feelings or just really any feelings at all, of like, hey, that one group you mentioned, uh, you know, here's uh, some reasons to think twice or anything along those lines. Or if you think they're not values aligned, um, please uh, let me know. And definitely happy to uh, to host more kind of open dialogues in that regard. Uh, but I see we're going to be hitting time shortly, so I'll I'll just stop there and want to thank everyone for joining in on the conversation uh, and yeah, just jumping in and and contributing to some of this kind of public brainstorming as we are generally transitioning. So yeah, thank you everyone, and I hope you all have a good rest of your Thursday wherever you are in the world. <laughs>